know, we have, um, you know, TSA's Canine Training Center. Mr. Danny Diller is going to talk about, uh, you know, what uh, a little bit of, we've been supporting them for, for many years. Uh, they've, they've been willing to look uh, and, and adjust both con ops and their training to try and, um, you know, serve their mission space better. Uh, you know, I applaud them for that, but, uh, you know, Mr. Diller is going to get up here and, uh, you know, especially from the training side, give a, a, a perspective on just how daunting of task, a task the TSA canine program is. So, um, you know, we, we appreciate them being here today and, and being able to, sh to share that in this. I think it's, it's, it's very important. It's a, it's a very unique explosive detection program, the largest domestic uh, program in, in the country. So thanks, Danny, for being here, Mr. Diller. Thanks, Don, and welcome, everybody. It's my distinct pleasure to uh, represent the Canine Training Center at the TSA, as Don mentioned, one of the largest bomb dog programs that we have in the program. Uh, we, I'm going to give you a little brief history of the program, where we came from, where we're at today, why we, we enjoy our uh, collaboration with s and because we do give a good test base of multiple dogs, uh, which is a key element when we're running these scientific tests and all. So with that, a little brief history green button, right? There we go. So from two, uh, 1972 to 2005, we were a portion of the military working dog program at Lackland Air Force Base. Uh, we still hold on to some legacy programs with, the, with that particular program. You'll see with our procurement slide, it's coming up here next. Um, really integrated with the military working dog program. So we try to cross share information across that program very well. 2005, we were ultimately transitioned to the TSA and became what we now know today as the TSA Canine Program. You can see the numbers there. We've grown from, uh, you know, 30 dogs a year over to almost 1,100 across the program nowadays, um, which requires us to put a lot of dogs into the training program every year, uh, which, again, gives us an availability of some scientifically or statistically um, sound numbers uh, when we do some of this testing. And our testing that we do down there, not only does it drive strategic change in our own program, it also, we, we want that to go to the industry, uh, which is what this today is all about, is get, getting the information that is out there that we're all working toward into the hands of the user. So key element for that. So again, you see some of the personnel growth uh, and why we're able to do some of these larger studies down there. Uh, we're now at 137 personnel at the Canine Training Center. Uh, with about 25 different venues uh, that are available for different testing and different operational uh, events. So currently we have two uh, basic handler courses that we teach, a 12-week standard explosive detection canine course and a 16-week pasture screening canine course. So since 2012, uh, TSA, in response to the underwear bomber, has been deploying pasture screening canine, which was, uh, I know my friends from Auburn are in the... Uh, audience here today, uh, which was really kind of a new technology that Auburn kind of piloted and, and we picked up on in response to the underwear bomber. Uh, so we've employed uh, these type dogs that are screening for explosives on personnel. Uh, been some trials and tribulations, been, been a lot of lessons learned in that realm. And as we continue to expand that footprint into local uh, state tribal law enforcement entities, uh, we, we look to be a portion of that solution and, and give our lessons learned so we're not recreating the wheel. Um, 16 weeks is a long time for pasture screening canine uh, handler to be gone away from home. Um, that's a recent change in our model because of some of the things we've done with S&T with the change to con ops, as Don mentioned. Uh, we've now gone to what we call the open queue concept, which expands the work area that the canine team actually has to work within the checkpoint. Um, it meters the passengers uh, through that checkpoint uh, to give the dog an opportunity to work the most productive area, which we know that's, that's the end state of any canine detection, right? Is put the dog in the productive areas where it has an opportunity to detect the odor. Um, so that con op dro drove some changes. Uh, it realized that it took a little longer to train the canine to get to that point, and it took the handlers a little bit uh, to be a little bit more keen on the change of behavior in that program. So we extended the training from a 12-week course to a 16-week course and reduced the pre-training on the canines so that the handlers are actually brought in on the ground floor of imprinting odors and teaching the canines basic task. Uh, we think that's going to make a better handler in the field. Um, we're seeing some improvement. S&T is going to help us prove that over the next several or a couple of years as we get this fully rolled out to all of our airport locations. Um, 
and we'll look to, to continue that collaboration and putting out some, some good studies that show that this is the right, right impact that we're having on, on the program. So uh, on average, CTC, we have approximately 240 canines in any, any stage of training. Um, they just kind of show you the scope of the operation and again, why we can collaborate on some larger studies uh, in order to, to prove or disprove particular or traditional canine methodologies of what we're doing. So uh, in addition to that, just another thing, you know, within the TSA canine program to give you a brief overview, uh, as a third party entity, all of our teams report to an operations branch, which are up there in the peanut gallery somewhere, Gary and Talene and a couple other folks. Uh, but we do, a hundred, uh, we do over 1,000 evaluations per year as a third-party evaluation on all of our teams. In addition to that, a portion of maintaining operational proficiency throughout the year, we've also gone to a quarterly assessment through our operations regional canine training as association. So we've moved kind of away from the model of only seeing a team once a year and assuming that they're maintaining their, their skill sets throughout the rest of the year. So that, that's something else that we've, we've driven a change on. Oh, TSA canine procurement. So we're, we're very happy to, to engage with our industry. Uh, one of the th unique things about our program, again, as I mentioned, we, we come from the DOD Military Working Dog Program. One of the legacy programs we have for that, we still procure a majority of our canines through the DOD acquisition system. Uh, through an interagency agreement we have, that pro provides us about 270 dogs per year. Um, and then uh, our full production mode, we can train about 350 canines a year to give you the, the scope of the operation once again. Uh, so that requires us to buy about 130, 140 additional canines out of our own TSA acquisition process. I bring that up to the greater community here because we realize that there are some challenges. Um, if we have breeders in the, in, the, um, in the audience today, there's some challenges in reaching out to dogs that are available out there in the world um, just because the acquisition process is a bit arduous. Uh, but as, as we move through this, we've got a couple of initiatives moving forward uh, that we will work to limit those challenges and actually deal better with the community so we can tap into the dogs that are out there and address some of the supply issues that we see within the current acquisition process. So we look forward to having more industry engagement on that. Um, we'll partner with S&T in doing that. Uh, we've, got, we've got a little bit of, if you're aware, that we did put together a breeding consortium model a couple of years ago, we've, we've re-energized that just this past year. Uh, the TSA administrator signed that document yesterday. Uh, so we'll get that back before Congress and hopefully we'll see a, a large scale um, effort to put together academia, the breeding industry, the canine industry, and the federal government to expand uh, the availability in, in this community supporting the federal government's efforts in canine. So in our canine procurement, um, current breeds that we currently work with, are, we do still produce a few German short hair pointers, Belgian Malinois. Uh, however, because of the passenger screening and the public perception of the sporting breed dogs, we do kind of lean toward and prefer uh, most of our canines are in the sporting breed community of Labrador Retrievers, German short hair pointers, uh, being the two prevalent breeds that we have there. Um, for us, uh, although the, the uh, Walking through the airport, as Don mentioned earlier, is not a strenuous environment to work a dog in. It is a dynamic environment to work a dog in. So really our environmental stability is something that we look at as our first uh, criteria when we're testing the dogs is, do they recover well in, in a strange environment uh, of the testing environment? Um, but we're always looking to, to quantify the testing environment. What does that look like? And then ultimately, as we deal with the breeder community, what's the rearing strategy that's gonna prepare the dog for the for the dynamic or arduous environments that will feed the government, government's needs. So that's a key element of what we look for. Obviously with detection, our, our particular training model is under a prey object uh, training model. We don't use any food reward dogs in our, our program. Uh, so the hunt and the fetch drive that, that the dogs display is also a key element. Uh, and then obviously will they search for the reward and what have you. So, and then obviously availability. With buying 420 dogs a year, uh, that's, that's a pretty good demand for, for the limited number of vendors that we see, although there's 22 of those currently. We would like to see it to be 50. So as we have our networking, uh, that if you're in that breeding community, we'd like to hear what the challenges are that you see to the impediment of us reaching out to the, to the community that's out there. And our S&T collaborative efforts. Uh, TSA's long established relationship, uh, we are not afraid to look internally at our own processes and what we're doing with our canines and what 
the best process is. In fact, we, we tout that real reg regularly that we have some scientific rigor behind our program and we look to continue that relationship with S&T to provide us with that data so we can quantify what it is that we're doing. We have a lot of testing mechanisms that we do, our annual evaluation, our current uh, quarterly uh, assessments, uh, S&T testing, our own internal covert testing that we run, um, and, and we're con continually taking all of those test results and modif modifying the program uh, for the betterment so that we're actually using these canines and addressing what are their limitations and what are their capabilities. Um, as we put all of that in the mix, we'll continue to reach out to the scientific community as we make those tr uh, transitions so that we can uh, quantify where we're at and what, what's the overall effectiveness of the teams. As Cliff was mentioning there a while ago, you know, part, part, of the, part, of, part of the process is to figure out what are the limitations that we currently have. If that's training program limitation because we've gotten comfortable being great, then we need, we need to have that, that, that scientific piece come in or that unknown piece come in and look to see where we can be greater. So uh, we, we definitely look to have that. So uh, we did conduct an odor generalization study uh, that, that allowed us, TSA's uh, odor list had grown uh, quite extensively over the, over the past decade or so uh, with a lot of adding of odors with every new threat stream that would come across the line. Um, and, it, and it got to the point of diminishing returns. So we'd, we were able to do an odor generalization study and pare that back down to a reasonable number of training aids uh, that we think we get the most bang for our buck. So, um, so that was that was a very key key point for us. Um, and then, like I said, hopefully that filters out through the community. We look at what industry standards is, and we stay within industry standards. Uh, but if we can drive that industry standard through scientific analysis, so much the better, um, so that we're getting the most bang for our buck. Because we all know no unlimited training time out there. So, uh, brought up that breed consortium, consortium just a minute ago. Uh, that was a real large effort that we were able to put together and get up off the ground uh, based on some of s and uh, previous work. Um, we put together a, a great panel of end users, vendors, academia, scientists, uh, S&T and ourselves, brought all those people together, put a lot of smart people in a room, developed a, developed a framework and a strategy. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've, we've got that signed by the administrator. We'll get it to Congress and then hopefully we'll be able to expand that working group Excuse me, I'm gonna lose my voice. Um, we can expand that working group into a, into a governance board, uh, and then we can really drive some industry uh, improvement as far as providing some, some uh, breeding uh, guidance, training guidance, and then ultimately putting, putting the end users in touch with the vendors to, uh, to increase the domestic supply of canines. So, key thing. All right. And then our, uh, it's a couple of up upcoming uh, things that we have, and one of them we've actually kicked off on. We've actually started the condensed odor recognition uh, evaluation. Uh, that's an efficiency for us uh, to, to modify our imprinting protocol and criterion numbers uh, to something that's a bit more uh, succinct. However, it also adds distracting odors into that uh, piece of it, so we're able to actually differentiate and quantify and prove that our dogs are only responding to explosive odors and not just something that might be novel. So we're, we've, we've implemented that at, at the CTC. We're seeing great results with it. Um, and we think, think that's gonna be the way of the future for, for absolutely sure. Um, moving forward, um, we look to do more operational testing of the canine teams. So with that, as, as Cliff mentioned, a bit more threat-based item uh, testing. Uh, some odor containment testing of what uh, containment actually does to particular odors instead of just kind of in general containment reduces the amount of odor to dogs okay T tell me something I don't know right so we want to look at it specific to the odors and then find out do we have a capability gap that maybe canine is not the right answer to answer to if we can prove that then we can then we can look to actually covering down on the actual gap that we have in our security layers so and with that, Don, I may be a little quick, but more time for networking. So.